Warm welcoming you back to this our show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Human Humane Architecture, and you see which viewer you are, and this is our 313th show. So uh, we, uh, you here, but you see me, Martin Despang, and uh, last week we promised we would have the other Martin Ancelini back, and of course, the Soto Brown. They are not with us today. The Soto had to um, sneak out because of an urgency, and Martin, we let wrap up his um, um, imaginations about Lahaina and uh, wrap up the semester, and then we bring him back for uh, De Soto having provoked us positively about my culture that also had been leveled to the ground, in part burned for different reasons, and uh, you guys, Americans, helped us back on our feet. So for the time being, we go back and compare our windy cities today, and that is the, Chico the city of Chicago, Illinois, and the city of Honolulu, Hawaii, in which we are in and we're broadcasting from. And put these things into perspective of culture informed by climate, which we often in fossil times where we can just fake the temperature that our human body actually naturally needs. And we are a very sensitive species, maybe needless to tell you, but just to remind you if you don't think of yourself like that, because we are very warm blooded. Uh, and so our blood temperature is 100 Fahrenheit close to around a Fahrenheit, and uh, this is around 40 Celsius. But the ambient temperature to sustain that um, is actually mid-70 Fahrenheit, and which is translates into mid-20s Celsius. So a couple of degrees off, both to above it or below it, actually ticks us off and makes us sick, which I, you wouldn't have to care, but I am right now, I have a flu, and that probably comes from, again, having gotten too cold. I just came from San Francisco. Mark Twain, who also visited us here, uh, has been in San Francisco and has said uh, the coldest winter is the summer in San Francisco or the fall or any season because it's kind of damp cold. So when we're reporting about Chicago, if you do the weather check right now, it's actually very nice and sunny, but it's below 32. And 32 is where liquids, as blood is a liquid too, but again, it doesn't even need to go down below 32 Fahrenheit, which is zero Celsius, is where liquids freeze. And so that is what will happen in Chicago, uh, is happening in Chicago right now, because like nine below Celsius, uh, which is in the 20s. And uh, next week, actually, when then precipitation happens, then that uh, wet stuff that comes out of the sky from the clouds actually turns white and is snow. That we never have. However, right now we are in our first really rainy week. That uh, water, by the way, is the essence of nature. We all need it. We need to hydrate us. When you got a cold like me, you got to refill all the time. And plants need to do that. And we had a really dry phase, and now we really need that water, but maybe a little bit more evened out. Now we get it all in one week. So we just want you to keep that in mind when we look through uh, the slides here, which are only one dimensional. They only show us an image. And so that image does not become an illusion of maybe what you want to see or you're told you want to see. But please activate all your senses as to fully immerse yourself in the comparison we are making. Why are we taking us to Chicago through me about now more than a year ago in uh, May of um, uh, last year? We sent me there uh, because we found out that the majority of our high rises are actually coming architectural authorship wise from the city of Chicago. So we thought it's worth going to Chicago and check why that is and what we can learn from it and what maybe we better don't learn from it. So this first slide here, what you see, this building here is by my dear buddy, Dan Kubrick, who I went to school with in the Prairie in Nebraska in the early 90s. You see him at the bottom down there. And uh, so we then also had a great adventurous trip uh, going to uh, New York, eventually stopping in Chicago, which you always love. I love too. That was the first American city I ever uh, saw and it really fascinated me and continues to fascinate me. At that time, we were driving my parents back to uh, New York where they flew out back to Germany. 
And uh, we went on an all-American road trip that my father was very generous. And by the way, it's his birthday today. So happy birthday, Dad. Happy 83rd birthday. And thank you for all your generosity that we were the beneficiaries from all my life and Dan on that trip too, because he put us up in this nice hotel that you see at the middle, at the top, the small image there, and uh, was gracious to, to you know, host us there and house us there. So um, when Dan then came to take his dream job with the German-born architect Helmut Jahn uh, years later after graduation in 2005, um, we, uh, when I came back uh, to uh, teach and to code in my alma mater in Nebraska, I took the students there to check out what Chicago has to offer. And that's something I really miss here. It's a huge uh, effort to get us off the rock here, to fly to another city, even San Francisco. Um, it's a five, six hour flight and it's quite expensive. Uh, and at least um, in Chicago, to Chicago from Lincoln, you can hop into a car as we did. We were reporting in our show quoted top ride automobile architecture show into Jeff Chetwick's rusted out Honda Civic. It takes you about a little more than that time, but you only have one tank of gas for a very efficient car. So it's much more approachable and doable with the emerging generation. So um, that being said, uh, when Dan then took the job with Helmut Jan, that was his dream job in his dream city, he was the project architect of this building here, and he walked by that hotel every day and remembered the hospitality of my father and said that always got him into a good mood. So thanks, Dad, you, you had an impact on, on this building here. And why are we showing that? It looks very similar to what we're known here, right? But again, as we were just reminding ourselves, the climatic circumstances are totally different. So buildings actually should not look the same. Actually, we have to say this building actually looks better than we get these days because the more recent high rises by Howard Hughes and Kaka'ako don't even have what we actually only should have here, which is the lanai, which is the outdoor living space that covers us from the rain, which we have right now, and from the sun, which we have usually. But other than that, there's no environmental circumstances that we got to have to shelter us from. Very much the opposite in Chicago, Illinois. So this building here has loggias. Loggias are sort of tucked in lanais. They give you more protection from the sides, uh, which is uh, necessary here. And if you imagine the physics of architectural practice um, and the construction management, which Dan is doing there with his hard hat, um, if you have to design under both extreme heat circumstances where things expand under extreme heat, many, if not to say most materials, or in the winter they contract, things get actually smaller. We told you in another show about transportation, which we actually get to next. Again, uh, that the tram station out of a steel bridge we did, uh, which is basically um, uh, very long, uh, very several hundred feet, you know, um, uh, gets bigger by a foot um, in, in the summer and accordingly shrinks in, in the winter time. So having to design to that also on a lanai, on, on, a, on a loggia, that's where the snow will pile up. And when the snow melts, it becomes ice before it really becomes water again. And we all know from our um, freezing compartment in our refrigerators, when we put a bottle of whatever beverage in there and we forget about it, what happens at birth, right? And that we know that water, when it freezes, gets bigger. So can you imagine you have, you have frozen snow, um, snow that became ice on the lanai, you have to design everything in a way that it's not cracking and leaking. So it's a lot more hard, it's a lot harder to do this under temperate climate, which means for us, we should take it more easy, not the easy way out, and just copycatting what unfortunately is the case, which is the point we try to make, but actually uh, you know, build in taking advantage of our more privileged circumstances, meaning we could build easier and we could build cheaper. And that's the point of the article we see running there as a column on the top left, which is from March of this year, which is the emergency proclamation of our governor, Josh Green, right? Because we have a serious housing crisis everywhere in the world and not any different in Chicago 
uh, than, than in Honolulu. And that needs to be tackled. So you might say, well, this is, seems like a more luxurious, a more upscale high rise, and it certainly is. But given that, it's already better than what Howard Hughes and their architects, Solomon Coltwood Buons, that we get to later, who, which is the firm that we predominantly get here, is doing currently towards the end in Kaka'ako because they have to be done soon. That's why they're popping it out rather frantically, as we think, as we will share with you soon. So uh, talking uh, the need of housing for the underserved, the underprivileged, that gets us to the next slide. So this is the, um, the notorious Cabrini Green location. You might remember, uh, and if not, do your homework. This is where the city of Chicago and the city in the 60s wanted to do something for the underserved and was bringing up the social housing project and program, and they built these buildings which then, uh, as many say, and which ultimately uh, led to um, it being demolished, failed. <laughs> so um, Dan's office, Helmut uh, Jan at that time, um, Murphy Jan was still called Murphy Jan, I guess, and then they transitioned to Jan, um, did this project, which is in fact something we need so urgently here, which is for people who were formerly houseless and now have a shelter, and that's the building that they did um, in uh, uh, actually the year before the high rise. And as always, when you do something Cabrini Green, right, the architects Epstein's and Sun, they did not intend to do something that failed. They intended, with their best intention, they meant to do something that serves the people, that helps the people. But several circumstances, social ones, uh, first and foremost, economical ones, um, uh, led to it then failing, and so, but they at least have tried, right? When we're criticizing, we're not even really trying to an extent that we're doing. So to criticize something that has tried is maybe even unfair. So it is with this project here, because this is an article that I quote here at the top right, where someone assesses it some years after and says, well, maybe not as green as it, as it was aiming for. Again, that might be true, but again, I'm absolutely saying they tried. And what you see, what I wanted to point out, which I've never seen here, and I want to see, which you see at the top of the building, these are domestic size wind turbines. And talking the windy cities, we have constant air velocity wind. And we know the whole discussion about the big traditional wind turbines out there in pristine landscapes and fundamentalist Hawaiians feeling it's an offense to their culture and to their gods. And there's a whole, depending on where you stand in that discussion here. So this could be a great alternative. Bring wind energy generation into the urban fabric through some very nice, slim and, and, and not uh, eye-soaring uh, systems that you put on the roof. And that was a prototypical uh, attempt by the office um, of my best buddy, Dan. And I give them that, that they, that they tried. And so next page trying, um, we are also notoriously short on, next slide, uh, on uh, housing for the emerging, so for students. And so this is student housing that um, Dan designed together with Helmut for the IIT, the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology that we remember was uh, led for a long time by German immigrant um, Mies van der Rohe. Um, who also is the father of the typology of that we get here a lot, the steel skeleton or the skeleton at all um, high rise. They're mainly here out of concrete, of course, but he um, uh, evolved, it, evolved it into steel. So this is, uh, this is student housing. Looks pretty cool, right? And literally and figuratively speaking, and you could now go into the nitty gritty details and Ecotech energy model it and see what's actually has energy consumption. But again, it's primarily and, and gestually for the very least doing the right thing. And it's also doing something way better than we will see in a minute that we're doing here because there's actually public transportation, the extension of the L that we will see, which is the historic elevated train in downtown in the urban core of uh, Chicago. Illinois, it runs by, right by the building and it has um, a train station next by. That is not, that's the one at the bottom right. That is not by Jan, that is, and Dan, this is by um, Marim Kohlhaas. Um, if, you know, architecturally 
criticizing that or both, I, I leave it up to you guys. I don't want to make that judgment. We don't want to get that deep into it. But we want to get that deep with for us back home. So the next slide, please. Because this is the this is the sibling condition of when our emerging generation, our students, go up uh, to our campus. Um, there is no uh, public transportation except this totally outdated hermetic fossil bus. Sometimes they're hybrid. There's some who are electric. But again, that's, that's not cutting it. We're in the tropics, right? We want to be exposed to the natural uh, condition, thermal condition, whoever created it here has done it right. And my, uh, we shared my sort of provocative evolution theory that whoever that was might it be have been he she it or whoever you decide had serious uh, attention deficit disorder and could only get it right here then losing it and having some minions having to pick up from pieces of uh, not ideal circumstances of climates that are either too cold or too warm so we really want to capitalize and this is a cynical or ironic picture we took because it shows the building as Bundet and I get excited about scaffolding, which could actually be a really simple system if you like code requires scaffoldings for every building, not under construction only, but actually for finished building, you already would create lanais around the buildings that would shape the building. You could put plants there, you could put people there. Um, unfortunately, then this was only the last phase, uh, next slide, before the building then turned into this here, which is very uh, unfortunate. And I'm going to, you know, uh, put myself into a conflict of interest because I'm also going to teach in the Scheidler Business School, the travel industry management department in the spring resort design. And they are behind uh, that building that they call the Rise. And we um, are very disappointed in the building because uh, not only is it exclusive, we said, um, in the Halamanoa that we will see next, uh, the room is about 750 bucks a month. Here it's twice or more of that. In the Halamanoa, it's all easy breezy and beautiful. Here it's all hermetic. So why would you do that? When people, again, that person there knows how to do it, all you need is an umbrella to give you the, the, the shelter from, in that case, the sun, today the rain. So next slide. Speaking of Halimanoa, here it is, but in a way we were not able to see it uh, until now because there were buildings in front of it that just got torn down. And now you see Halimanoa and you also see that burn school building that John Hara built, uh, that show quote there in the middle that we were reporting about having them as guests on the show. So um, just having returned from San Francisco, having met up with Kurt, Kurt Sandburn, our utmost architecture critic, who we missed so much ever since he was uh, sort of kicked out by Civil Beat, shame on them. I, uh, I, we dearly miss him. And Kurt was referring to Fred Bernstein, a dear friend of his, who is an architectural critic, who recently says, we architectural critics, which we are, DeSoto, you and I are too, uh, wanting or not, but feel we have to since you Kurt are not available for it anymore but Kurt you reminded us uh, by quoting Fred that architectural critics have to consider the uh, carbon footprint uh, the gray energy um, the embodied energy he calls it of a building because he cannot anymore look at the buildings as when I was educated where it was all the pretty look of it even my progressive professor Alex Mella asked me, what's the form determining factor? Today, we ask our emerging generations, we have to, as Kurt and Fred confirm, what is the performative um, determining factor? So Halimanoa um, here again uh, from the southern elevation and talking embodied energy, they just wrecked this, right? So they just neglected what was there and all the carbon footprint that was there and that could have been reutilized in one way or another, either keeping the building and repurposing the building into student housing, if that is not possible, which seems the case because there's a lot bigger program, then at least how we share it as we did it with when we replaced the first, uh, which became designed by us, the first um, post-fossil preschool building for my hometown in Hanover, where we had to tear down the not-to-be-saved previous building 
we took it apart like reuse hawaii um basically promotes it here right you want to take it apart in pieces and then separate it and then keep these pieces and and put them into new buildings again that is all not happening here which is really quite a shame so next slide which also um our projection is will be a shame because in the show quote at the middle uh, on the right, which is just from, I think, last or the week before, where Martin Ansolini, as a member of the studio, the architectural studio, was visiting the Hall Manoa and said, it's so fresh, although it's 60 years old, it's as young as you can be. The top right, um, many years ago by now on the show, another group of students had then basically said, well, if it works so well, why don't we just continue that genetic code and built that student housing that our contact person to student housing at that time gave us that site. And they just said, well, then now let's optimize. It's hard to say you can even you know, optimize an IMP, but we analyzed that the Southern Fenestration, if you would extrude it a little bit more, it would actually perfectly shade the Northern side anyways. Not so much the new building on the left column, all the pictures on the left part of that page here is the projected new. That building is running the other direction, which you might say macro workflow. Oh, Martin, I heard you saying that straight because it's going with Malcolm Mackay. Well, that is that is OK. But then comes the solar penetration and they don't even fake it. Right. The computer rendering in the center there shows uh, that must be either the east or the west uh, orientation, fenestration orientation. My, I think it's the west side. And shamelessly, they show how that sun penetrates through that last layer which seems pretty much fixed glazing so that sun the sun rays will basically turn uh into heat and uh, will bake you in the building and you likely need air conditioning so once again why don't we open our eyes and learn from the modern masters especially when they are right next door they are our neighbors and uh, this building, when you do a little bit, join us for detective work, who's going to operate the building here. It's a firm that's called Graystar. And I want to get, you know, silly or cynical about names, but, you know, me, English never be my native language. I'm thinking, hey, isn't a Graystar kind of an eye disease? I mean, speaking of, you know, where I'm going cynically, don't they see, right? Open your eyes because you have them. So why are we that skeptical on top of already looking at these things here? Get us to the next slide, because Graystar brings back memories, bad memories, because they're also operating this building, which was the first one of that kind, really bad, um, exclusive, hermetic, invasive. Um, there was mold in there that they're not arguing there wasn't. Come on. I mean, same with our contact person, Hiram Peo, who was with uh, Hi Hiram. Uh, who was with student housing said that um, he his comment about the new housing was hopefully it's not going to be causing freer again. And that's another cynical joke because there's freer hall down there. That is also, by the way, if we can go back to the previous slide one more time, Michael here, because they pride this development as P3, which means public private partnership as they spell it out there. And that freer hall was of the same thing. What that actually means is that I, as, a, as, a, as an institution, as a university, in this case, don't have the guts anymore to be climbed by myself. I don't trust myself in that. And so I cry for help. And I turn to people, unfortunately, who have predominantly financial interests. So it's, it's all about capitalism. It is not about culture. So what you get for that is actually going back to the next slide is what you get here. And that's something we certainly don't want to see and the remaining few minutes here, I want to get your spirit back up what we should see. And this is that next slide here, which um, across from that horrible new building from the previous slide is the varsity building. And I will correct or uh, make myself more explicit than in that show, varsity vanity from way back. Please come here may school who is also an underwriter of the show, one of the main underwriters. Please, please don't tear any of these buildings down, especially not the mid-century modern marvels. This is a Pete Wimberley building, the varsity building, and it's done right if you watch that show. So I take back when we said, well, if it would have to be torn down, we would ask Pete retrospectively up wherever he is 
um, because he's long dead. Um, if we could then build a Primitiva one, which is a tower that tries to implement similar <coughs> strategies of people and planet friendliness, but again, don't. Keep the varsity and build maybe this next door because there's a big parking lot. And then what you see on the top, on the left there is a lift, is a ski lift without skis because there's no snow. But the ski lift technology that will basically bring you, the emerging generation, in a decent way up the University Hill. You can scoop through the, through the treetop height and you can make your homework last minute. Doesn't that sound great? Especially now being finals week. And final, it's probably going to be our final slide here. Next slide. Is that almost too much to ask? No, it is not, because this is from my research summer back in Dresden, Germany, where our office is. So here we have that stuff from a long time ago. This is at the beginning of the last, well, the, the century, the last century. In 1901, it did the suspended rail system that uh, Bunnit Kanistakon and Richard Lowe, um, both friends and collaborators and previous guests on many shows are so fond of. They know of the one in the city of Wuppertal, but this one here is one in Dresden as well. And they're kind of competing which, which one was pretty much first. And there's some really fascinating documentation that I took pictures of here because they also proposed this tropical version. And of course it has a colonial taste, which is the one that is maybe not so good, but technology wise, this is really cool. So I grew up, we see my grandmother here and I was, I grew up with, born with skis on as I like to say. So I've, every year we visited my grandma here and we went up to ski and we were in the ski lift and it's just, it's just really great. So um, that being said, um, the picture at the bottom right, I wanna, um, at the bottom, uh, yeah, at the bottom right, I wanna close on because I find that fascinating and it provokes me because I've just been out west and I've been driving under the heavy rail and I see where that sort of section of that big thrust uh, curves back. I see these cavity spaces that I would like to be taken by a system like that, by the self pedaling, you know, a rail system that you can get your workout done. You don't have to use, um, you know, 24 seven fitness. You're actually protected by the rain. So you kind of, you know, make something good out of something not so good because the heavy rail, as we keep talking, was maybe too much. But that way you could improve it and better it. Again, there's my parents down there at the bottom in the middle. So happy birthday, Dad, again. And uh, uh, picking up from that one here and going back home because you might say, well, Martin, this is where, where you're from and that's there and you are here. No, this technology and all this good stuff has made it to us as well pretty close, so we will make, our next stop will be LA, and we will show you a similar system, and then we go back to Honolulu, where we should all have this again, because we will have it, uh, because we had it before. Okay, uh, that being said, um, uh, have a good week till then, and please stay easy breezy versus uh, wacky windy. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.